Esther 6. That night the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honour and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His descendants answered, his attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honour? Now Haman thought to himself, hmm, who is there that the king would rather honour than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king honor, delights to honour, have them wear a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honour, and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Afterwards, Mordecai returned to the king's gate but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisers and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, I think we all hate injustices, don't we? And uh, these injustices can stay around for a long time. I remember one time when I was about eight, and we're talking about 59 years ago now, so it's hung around a long time. Uh, And my younger sister accused me of doing something that I didn't do. Um, I promise you, I didn't do it, honestly, I didn't do it. And I got in trouble with my father, and so he gave me a good row, sent me to bed early. But the thing that really hurt me were, that day was not the row or being sent to bed, it was the fact that I was accused of doing something I didn't do, and it really, really hurt. I'd rather have had a smack or something, but I didn't do it. Uh, I forgive my sister now, well, last year anyway. But. Uh, <laughs> So it's all right, but uh, we all want justice, and we want to see justice down. It's inherent in us. But as we know, life isn't always like that. In fact, it seems to me sometimes that there's more injustice than justice nowadays. People seem all too often to get away with it. For example, in Psalm 73, Asaph is telling God that the enemies of Israel have been mocking him, destroying the temple, and ruining and destroying all the wonderful uh, oak panelling in the, in the temple. All these things have been done to the glory of God, and they've been torn off the walls and ruined. And he's crying out to God, why are you silent? Why aren't you doing anything? Why don't you act? And there's a lovely part in verse 11 where Asaph cries out to God, why Do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the folds of your garment and destroy them. You know, don't hide your hands behind your back. Do something. He speaks for us all. When wicked people seem to get away with literally murder and the victims, innocent victims, are denied justice. And yet we're told over and over again in the Bible that God is a God of justice. Moses says in Deuteronomy, he's a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. 
Well, the truth is that the wicked will not get away with it forever. God does not forget. He sees, as the Collect says, into the secrets of our hearts. Psalm 139 says, it doesn't matter where we go, we cannot escape his gaze. And that, for me, is one of the most satisfying and comforting doctrines of the whole Bible, is that God is a God of justice. And one day, one day, there will be a reckoning. God promises that when his son returns, in the words of the old Apostles' Creed, he will come again to judge the quick, which means the living, and the dead. He will come to judge the quick and the dead. Now, what's all this got to do with Esther? Well, as you know, God is nowhere mentioned anywhere in this book. His presence is not obvious, but it's woven into every page. We may not see him, but he's there. We've just discovered now that we've got a mole in the garden. And uh, I've never seen the mole, really. I thought We thought we saw a head poking up one day, but we weren't sure. But we see mounds everywhere. But there he is, he's ending the surface, he's working away all the time, tunneling around, eating his worms, and occasionally popping his head up over the surface. And it reminds me a little bit of God. You know, you don't see God at all in Esther. But every now and again, through the story, you see that he's working things through. His presence is woven into every page. He is there, even if we don't see him. And one of the ways we see um, him popping up his head, so to speak, is in the various coincidences that litter the story. Uh, like the ones in today's chapter. Here's the king, he can't sleep one night, so he asks for the book of Chronicles. Um, you and I would probably reach for a novel, but not him. He reaches to the book of the Chronicles to be brought and read to him. And coincidence number one is that given all that is happening so far in the story, what part does he read but the part of the Chronicles that refers to what Mordecai has done in frustrating the plans of the king's officers to assassinate him. And so the king asks, well, you know, what's been done to honour this man? He saved my life. Something should be done to recognise it. And so he says, what's, what's been done? And they say, well, nothing's been done. And so the king asks, well, who's in the court at the moment? So he can ask, ask their advice about what could be done. And the second Oic coincidence is, of course, it's of all people, it's Mordecai. Uh, sorry, it's Haman. Haman, the arch enemy of Mordecai and the Jews. And he's come to see about hanging Mordecai on the gallows that had been prepared. So you can see these coincidences are mounting up in a, in a wonderful way. But before he says to the king about hanging Mordecai, what does the king do but asks him the question, what honour should be given to the person that the king favours? And of course, Haman thinks, well, you know, thank you very much. I've served you well and at last you're going to honour me. So he says, well, it's some elaborate thing about wearing the king's cloak and riding the king's horse and somebody walking before him proclaiming that this is what is done for the man that the king delights to honour. So he thinks, here all ready for me, and the tables are wonderfully turned. For it's not him, but his arch enemy, Mordecai, who will sit on the king's horse, wearing the king's robe. And the person going in front of him to proclaim that here is the, what is done for the man that likes the king is Haman himself. And I can imagine that as this is read out, to a Jewish audience, which it is every year at the Feast of Purim. The story of Esther is read in its entirety every Feast of Purim. I can imagine there's a ripple of applause and a bit of a cheer because now it looks as if Haman is going to get his comeuppance. It's very pantomime, isn't it? It's wonderful. But what can we learn from this? Just quickly. The first is that even if we can't see God, it doesn't mean he's not active. In the words of the hymn, God is working his purpose out as year succeeds year. God is working his purpose out and the time is drawing near. Nearer and nearer draws the time. The time that will surely be when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's as sure as it is. The part, the ultimate goal of filling the earth with the glory of God. How can God's glory fill the earth unless there is justice? And sin has been dealt with. And this eternal, eventual rolling up to justice, we can see going on in the story of Esther. 
So that's the first thing. If we can't see him, he's still there. Second, God is ultimately, we may not believe it when we see what's happening in Israel now and in North Korea and in and Ukraine, but God is ultimately in charge. And it's perhaps easy to see in Esther because as the story unfolds, we see this happening before our eyes, so to speak. But so often as the psalmist discovered, things sometimes seem out of control and God has his hands in the folds of his garment. But Esther teaches us what someone has called the hidden sovereignty of God, that God is in control even though on the surface we aren't always aware of it. And what we see is chaos on this side, yet behind that God is still in control. I always love that um, poem of uh, William Cowper. God works in the mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Deep below it all, like the mole under the, under the, under the, uh, the lawn, God is kind of working his purposes out. And this he does, does in his unfathomable minds of never failing skill. I love that line. In Esther, the mysterious way of God has poked above the surface briefly for us to see as the story moves towards what I find is a satisfying conclusion for once. But even when nothing is happening, we must believe that God is still at work in his world and ultimately his will is going to be realised on earth as it is in heaven. After all, that's what invites us to pray with him, isn't it? And then lastly, the story of Esther points to the conclusion of everything. It points to a time when, says the prophet Amos, God will let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We are in the process of this. We are moving towards this conclusion. And the conclusion will be that justice will roll out and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You know, I grieve when I see all too often the wicked getting away with things in this life, never being brought to justice for the deeds, and usually dying at a good old age in Barbados or somewhere. But as the book of Proverbs reminds us, and I love the King James version of this, but as the book of Proverbs reminds us, and the book of Esther illustrates, whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. Justice is coming. Sometimes it seems to be done. Sometimes it's not. But one day it will come. And Esther is a reminder as it points towards the God who is the God of justice. Amen.